In this lecture, we will be looking at the first part of Chapter 22, Renaissance and Mannerism in Quecentro, Italy, uh, 1500 to 1599. Now, I've separated this chapter a little bit because there is a lot of information, so this lecture is just going to focus on to the point of the chapter up to mannerism. When we dis discuss mannerism, I'm actually going to put the second half of chapter 22 and then chapter 23 together. Um, so this will cover up to the point in the readings with mannerism. Now the chapter begins with a discussion of Michelangelo, 1475 to 1564, and it talks a little bit about Michelangelo's uh, temperament. Michelangelo, most people are familiar with him, but he was a very well-known and famous artist at his time, but he's also one of the first what we call the temperamental artistic genius. All in all, wasn't a really nice guy, wasn't really well-liked. He had uh, extreme temper, and he also believed that the artist should be the one to control the work and that the artist should not have to be limited by the restrictions of anybody, whether it be a patron or just the styles of the time. And in fact, you see this kind of temperament reflected in a lot of his artworks. Well, what we're going to see within this time period in the 1500s, the greatest patron of the arts was actually the Catholic Church. Julius II uh, called artists to Rome to come in to paint the Sistine Chapel, which had been commissioned by Pope Sixtus VI. Um, Julius II linked himself, he wanted to link himself to the greatness of Rome. In fact, when a pope is elected pope, they get to pick their name. And he um, chose Julius because he wanted to associate himself with the greatness of Julius Caesar. And the Pope Julius fully appreciated also the propagandistic value of visual imagery, meaning using it to convey specific uh, messages. Well, Michelangelo himself, and we'll talk about him more later in the lecture, he tended to focus on the human figure. In fact, he saw himself as a sculptor first and foremost. And we see this even in his paintings. He painted with the sculptor's eye for how light and shadow reveal the volume and surface of the human form. All right, the text breaks apart the high and the late Renaissance. Uh, the 16th century Italy was built on the foundations of the early Renaissance, so a lot of these ideas we're going to see the continue. And then your textbook breaks apart the high Renaissance and the late Renaissance. High Renaissance 1495 to 1520, um, and then they considered the late Renaissance after the deaths of da Vinci in 1519 and Raphael in 1520 up until mannerism. For our purposes, I'm fine with us just calling um, this the, the high Renaissance. So we have the early Renaissance and then this time period is the high Renaissance. During this time, we see the idea of the fine arts develop. And what this has is that the, this idea that there are certain genres of art, which are the fine art, sculptor, sculpture, um, painting becomes at this time. Some other themes that we see in the High Renaissance, it's called the High Renaissance because this was seen as the high point in Renaissance art. Again, we're going to see the influence of the Greek and the Roman world, but especially the Greek idea of this idealized form. When we look at Greek sculptures, we usually aren't looking at them knowing who the individual is. Like, we wouldn't look at it and go, oh, this is LeBron. We would know in works such as the discus thrower that this is the idealized body of man. Now, those in the Renaissance sought to capture the ideals of classic art, but they did not want to directly copy them. And so what we see is we're going to see these idealized forms were found through mathematical means this defined composition and proportion. The belief was that this, through the mathematical, um, mathematical means, was that we could find this harmonious universe in perfect order through the math. Compositions were arranged according to the mathematical order, and most compositions were closed, meaning that our eyes go into the center of the work and stay there. Again, the strong use of math, you can see this in work such as Raphael's Alba Madonna, where we see a strong central triangle, um, and we're going to see this continued in the works. Also, this is a time of continued discovery. Nicholas Copernicus, 1473 to 1543. 
uh, published his On the Revolutions of Celestial Bodies in 1543, and here he claimed that the Earth was, here he claimed that it was the Sun that was the center, and that the earth and everything else revolved around it. This is a very, very different idea from the geocentric world that people believed we lived in, meaning that the earth was the center and the sun and the planets revolved around this. In the geocentric universe was the idea supported by the church, saying that is how God had created the world. Well, Copernicus claims this was a heliocentric universe, meaning the sun is in the center and that everything else revolves around it. This is directly against church teachings, and theologists refuse to believe or support this idea. In fact, this, um, his text was placed in 1606. It was placed in the Index of Prohibited Books. But we will again see this idea soon in the Enlightenment. Also, this is the time of Francis Bacon, 1562 to 1626, who advocated for the scientific method. Now, the scientific method, you might remember, claims that actual observations needed to be made. That when you're trying to figure something out, you make a hypothesis, and then you test it to prove if this hypothesis or it's true or false. Um, he advocated for people no longer to rely just on blind faith. All right, well, the text is going to focus the beginning of this chapter on the three great Florentine artists of the time. Leonardo da Vinci, 1452 to 1519, Raphael, 1483 to 1520, and then Michelangelo, 1475 to 1564. And we're first going to look at Leonardo da Vinci. Um, Leonardo was born in Vinci, which was a small town near Florence. Hits his name, it means Leonardo of Vinci. He is the quint quintessential Renaissance man. He was trained in many fields, including botany, geology, geography, cartology, zoology, military engineer, animal lore, anatomy, physical science, hydraulics, and mechanics. And he believed his scientific investigations actually made him a better artist. His goal was to discover the laws underlying the processes in the flux of nature. He considered the eyes the most vital organs and sight the most essential function. He said through the eyes, individuals can grasp reality most directly and profoundly. Now, when we're talking about artworks, he saw himself, he preferred painting. He said painting is a matter of great mental analysis of greater skill and more marvelous than sculpture. And on page 625 in your text, you can see it's a very interesting aside comparing Leonardo and Michelangelo's different ideas on which is the greater art form. Now, Leonardo, in 1482, he left Florence for Milan because of the political instability in Florence, and he offered his services to Ludvico Sofria um, as a military engineer. Leonardo saw himself as a military engineer. In fact, we have different plans. Most people, you know, realize that he had ideas for a helicopter, but he also had created an armored tank um, and then one that was armed with scythes that would go around and spin. And so he would develop this type of weaponry. Interestingly enough, when he offered his, his services to uh, Luvico, he only kind of mentioned on the aside, like, oh yeah, and I'm also an artist. He then remained in Milan for the next 17 years, and he created many of his most well-known works in this time period, one of which we're seeing here. This is the Madonna of the Rocks, 1483 to 1490. It is an oil on wood, and it is lo still located in Milan, Italy. Here, this was the central panel of the altarpiece for the chapel of the Confraternity of the Immaculate Conception in San Francisco Grande. Here, what we see is we see the Madonna, the Christ Child, the infant John the Baptist, and an angel and a, a, um, a pyramid grouping. The figures are all united through their movements or gestures to each other. But what's very interesting in this, we still see these early Renaissance ideas, right? This use of natural um, subject matter where we're trying to show the images as lifelike as possible. We see the use of atmospheric perspective here where the objects in the front are larger and more in focus. The objects that are supposed to be farther away, if you look at the rocks in the foreground, are smaller and less in focus. 
But here we also see something interesting, and we see this tenderness between Mary and the children. Um, this you look at, and you almost see it more instead of being the iconographical Mary, Christ, and the baby John the Baptist, you almost see it as a mother with two small children. And this shows Leonardo's desire to show not just the people in his works, but to also show their souls, if you will. And this goes where he claimed the two chief goals of the painter were to paint the individual and the intention of his soul. He said the former is easy, the latter hard, for it must be expressed by gestures and the movement of limbs. Um, also here we're seeing he's using the newer medium of the oil-based pigments, which enable him to fully realize the full potential of the artist's craft. Now this is probably one of the two most well-known works of da Vinci. This is The Last Supper, 1495 to 1498. It is also his largest work. It's 13 feet 9 inches by 29 feet 10 inches. It is tempera and oil on plaster located in the Santa Maria della Grazia in Milan. Now, you notice I said it's temper, tempera and oil on plaster. This is not a traditional fresco. This is what we call dry fresco. He did not paint this in the plaster It was still as it was still wet, like we saw in Giotto's work um, in the Arena Chapel. Here, what he did is he painted it on top of the structure, on top of the wall after it was already dry. Because of this, it is very, very badly damaged. The paint started actually to flake off. And in fact, 80% of it, it, from them trying to restore and keep it, about 80% of it is restored work, meaning it's not Leonardo's original work any longer. However, it still is probably one of his most famous works. What's also interesting in this is the moment he decides to depict. What has happened here, we are at the Last Supper, and Jesus has just announced one of the apostles will betray him. And he makes the comment that the apostle even has their hand on the table. And if you look, there's really only two apostles with their hands on the table, the gentleman on the far left, but we can see both of his hands. The only other apostle with his hand on, hands on the table is Judith. His face, Judith, Judas. His face is in shadow, and we can see clutched in his right hand, he is also holding a bag of coins. And this is the 30 pieces of silver for which he betrayed Jesus. All right. Also, we again see here this naturalistic depiction of the group of individuals. We see the use of linear perspective here. This is to make a central focal point very clear. Now, this work has other smaller focal points, but if there is one clear focal point, and that is Jesus. In fact, the linear perspective, the vanishing point, is right at the top of Jesus' head. And what is interesting is when they were uh, restoring this piece, they actually found a little small nail hole there, and so they believe what the, um, da Vinci did was he actually used string to make sure he got every single line for this vanishing point absolutely perfect. All right. Uh, moving on, this is probably the next of his most famous works. This is the Mona Lisa, circa 1503 to 1505. This is an oil on wood, and it's actually quite a smaller piece. This is two feet, six and a quarter inches by one foot, nine inches. Um, what happens with this Vasari, we talked about him as one of the early art historians. He claims this is Lisa di Antonio Maria Ganderdi, who was the wife of a wealthy Florentine man. Um, however, we don't really know for sure. Mona is actually a contraction of the Italian Madonna, which means my lady. And so here, this is just my lady Lisa. Leonardo is focusing on painting here, and he's really, really trying to show the specific woman. And something about this, whether you know we focus on who she is or not, one of the things that is very interesting about this work is that she is looking directly into the eyes of the viewer. Now, this is something that would go against Renaissance etiquette of the time. Their idea was that women should not look directly into a man's eyes. Yet here we see her, right? Her, by connecting her view to ours, gives her ob um, subjectivity, that we can't just look at her as an object of the painting, but we must see and acknowledge her as a human. 
And again, this probably goes along with da Vinci's idea of showing the uh, showing the person the painting, not just themselves, but their soul. And so this probably tells us something that whoever this woman was, she was probably a bold individual and willing to challenge these rules of society. Also within this work, there's been many comments about the kind of mysterious background, the location that he has placed her in. But again, we again see the use of atmospheric perspective, and we see the details in the work that create it very naturalistically and realistically. Also within da Vinci's many, many notebooks, we see his interest in science, especially anatomy. And here are two examples of pages from his texts. The one on the left is the Vitruvian Man, circa 1485 to 1490, and this is supposed to show those idealized, perfect, perfect portions of an individual. The Vitruvian Man, it's not the name of this man, but it's this idea based off of the philosopher Vitruvius. And so that's why this is the Vitruvian Man. The other image is the fetus and lining of the uterus, circa 1511 to 1513. Now, this is not exactly biologically correct, but it is an outstanding representation for the time period, and it foreshadows many works to come. Now, what is interesting also is da Vinci originated the modern method of the scientific illustration incorporating the cutaway views that you see here with the inside of the uterus. All right, next we're going to move on to the second of the great Florentine artists, and this is Raphael. 1483 to 1520. He died very young. He was only 36 or 37 when he actually passed away. His name is Raphael of Santi, but he is known as Raphael. He was born in a small town in Umbria, and he was strongly influenced by other Renaissance artists, but over time he tended to develop his own style. In 1508, Pope Julius II also called him to Rome. Now, one of the works here, Marriage of the Virgin, 1504, Oil on Wood, this is one of his earlier works, and you can clearly see the influence of Renaissance ideas. We see a very realistic depiction of figures, use of perspective, both atmospheric and linear, and we again see these, this individualisticness about it. Each figure looks as their own person. Marriage of the Virgin, this is the moment where Joseph has been chosen to, to marry Mary, and this is actually the ceremony being performed. A little interesting fact on it, Raphael also signed and dated it. If you look on the building itself over the central arch, it says his name and the date. All right, well, as Raphael began to develop his own style, he became, became very well known for his Madonna portraits. Here we're looking at the Madonna in the Meadow, 1505 to 1506, and it's an oil on wood. Other such Madonna works are the Alba Madonna and the Madonna of the Goldfinch. And here what we're going to see, again, the subject matter one commonly shown in artwork. It's the Virgin Mary with the baby Jesus and the baby John the Baptist. Yet here we see the secular and the sacred um, are combined. And in fact, the sacred becomes minimalized. Meaning when we look at this, we don't just look at it again as the iconography behind it, meaning the message behind the figures, but it's much more natural. It's softer. And we see again this mother um, very loving with two children. Now, John the Baptist was not her child, um, but you still see this affection between them. Yet we do still see this mathematical influence. If you look, the symbol, the three objects in this, the three individuals, make up a very strong triangle. Now, what we're seeing here is Raphael's desire to depict Mary as a beautiful young mother tenderly interacting with her young son. All right, in 1508, again, Pope Julius commissioned, Julius II commissioned Raphael to paint frescoes within the Vatican Palace. The most famous are those in the Stanza della Stagnatoria, which is the room of the signature. In this room, this would be the room where the popes would sign the important documents of the day. There are actually four different frescoes, one on each wall, which represent philosophy, law or justice, poetry, and theology. 
The work you're looking at here is probably the most well-known of the four frescoes. This has been what is now known as the School of Athens, 1510 to 5011. It is a fresco, and it's 19 feet by 27 feet. In here, what we see is we see a gathering of learned men. And what's interesting here is all of these men are uh, philosophers, mathematicians from ancient Greece and ancient Rome. And in fact, if you look at the architecture in the background, you see there are two statues kind of overlooking them. Well, what we see is on the left is Apollo, the god of truth, music, and poetry. And on the right is Athena, the goddess of wisdom and reason. In the center of the men, we see Plato pointing up, talking about the idealized forms, and Aristotle is pointing down, more concerned with material reality and not ideal forms on another plane. Socrates is sprawled on the steps. Pythagoras, from the Pythagorean theorem, is in the lower left. Ptolemy, who was a Roman who focused on math, um, he was a geographer and astronomer, he's holding a globe on the far right. Euclid, the Greek father of geometry, is shown with the slate and the compass. Uh, Heraclides, who was a Greek philosopher, is shown in the center, drawing. And then Raphael, what's interesting here is we have all these great Roman and Greek thinkers of the time. But you have to remember the placement of this is very interesting because this is located in the Vatican, which is the seat of the church. And here we have all these individuals that the church would consider pagans. So what Raphael is trying to do here is he's trying to focus on these learned men, right? This fresco is definitely more about reason and not religious relationships. And what's interesting is that many people claim that the, um, the figure of Plato is actually a portrait of Leonardo da Vinci. Uh, Herodotus, who is in the foreground drawing, is actually Michelangelo. And then if you look in the gathering of men in the front right foreground, you can see Raphael actually puts himself in the work. He's the man kind of looking out at us with the little hat on. So what's interesting is he puts the artist of the day, of his day, with the great thinkers of the past. And here we see it shows calm reason, balance, and measure. And these were all qualities that were valued by the Renaissance thinkers. And then here's just a little chart um, labeling some of the individuals in the work. Now what's also interesting is the fresco directly across from this, uh, 1508 to 1509, this was actually the first one of the frescoes created. This is the disputation of the Holy Sacrament, meaning that we are looking actually at the functions of the church. And what happens here is you can see that we see in the sky, you see Jesus sitting in judgment, God is above him, Mary's to his right, John the Baptist is to his left, and then the rest of the apostles are sitting there. And then directly below, we see the altar of the church. So this is literally um, the Trinity, because we also see the dove underneath Jesus. That is the dove of the Holy Spirit. We see them literally bestowing onto the church the authority of the church. Now this fresco is, again, directly across from the School of Athens. And so here, what we notice with this placement is that Raphael is kind of reminding the men, the popes who work in this room, that you must find this balance between faith and reason. Now, at this time period, the church and the thinkers are still pretty much in harmony. However, over the next couple of years, we're going to see this definitely start to change. Great. And then a final work by Raphael is Galetta. This is circa 1513, and it's a fresco, 9 feet 8 inches by 7 feet 5 inches. This was a private commission, and it was located. it is located in the palace of Agostina Chigi, who was a wealthy banker in Rome. And he wanted his palace decorated with scenes from classical mythology, and that is what you see here. Uh, Galetta means she who is milky white. There's different stories with her. One is of the sculptor who created her as a sculpture and fell so in love with her. And Aphrodite grants his wish and brings her to life. But this is a different story. This is the one where she is the daughter of Nerus and Doris, and she was a sea nymph. 
and she fell in love with um, the son, I'm sorry, she fell in love with Asis, A-C-I-S. And Polythemus, who was a Cyclops, was jealous of this, and he was in love with her and wanted her. And so he actually kills Asis um, with a boulder. And so as his blood runs into the river, well, she actually gets away from him, um, from Polythemus. And so this is a moment of her fleeing away from him. You can see the dolphins, like, taking her away on the shell and other things they are trying to protect her. But um, the story does end kind of happy because A said he actually, as his um, blood ran into the river, she turned him into a river spirit, and so they were always able to be together. But the importance of this is, is that it again still shows this interest in the classical mythology. And we do still see a very strong influence of the classical myths. All right, now we're going to shift to the third of the great three Florentine artists. We've already talked about Michelangelo a little bit, 1475 to 1564. And Michelangelo, like da Vinci, was skilled in many areas, painting, architecture, and poetry, but he considered himself a sculptor above all. In fact, he said, the sculptor shares in the divine power to make men. The figure is imprisoned in the stone, and the sculptor must release it from the stone. And he said he found his ideas in the natural world, and that it is the artist's genius that brings the idea to life. Um, again, he wasn't really well liked. He had a very strong temperament. And interestingly enough, he did not trust the mathematical methods that were used and valued by so many other artists. He claimed that the judgment should be kept in the eyes. The hands do the work and the eyes judge. And he also claimed that the artist should be bound only by the demands of the idea that he is realizing. That other things such as the mathematics or even the patrons don't have a say in the artwork. The only thing that has a say in the artwork is the artwork. All right, here's one of his most famous works. This is the Pieta. In fact, it's the earlier Pieta, circa 1498 to 1500. It is made of marble, and it's five feet, eight and a half inches high. It's in Rome, um, and it is in the St. Peter's Basilica off to the right. right. Um, this was made for the Cardinal of St. Denis because he originally commissioned it for it to be part of his own tomb, but it was later moved into St. Peter's Basilica. In here, what we see again, we see Michelangelo not being concerned about this mathematical proportion. Because when we look at this Pieta, this is a moment where Mary is basically holding the body of her dead son. And if we look at this, and right during the, the, the biblical story, when Jesus was crucified, he was probably in his 30s, meaning Mary was probably in her 50s. Jesus probably physically was much larger than him. But when we look here, Mary is much, much larger than the, than the body of the fallen, of fallen Jesus. And the reason he does this with the proportions is the focus of this work is Mary, not Jesus. Imagine how this work would have been different if it was realistic proportions. Mary would be dwarfed by the body. But the importance here is that it's focusing on Mary mourning the death of her son. And in fact, if you look at Mary's face, she's actually portrayed as a young, beautiful woman. And so again, you can see here Michelangelo is not being concerned with the other, uh, the mathematics, or even realistically showing the work as it would have been, right, at that moment, but he's doing it more for the message to come across. All right, in 1501, he returns to Florence, and this is when he made probably his most famous work, which is the David, 1501 to 1504. It is marble, and it's over 13 feet tall. Now, this was commissioned by the Florence Cathedral Building Committee, and what it was originally designed to be placed was it was designed to be placed on top of the dome of the Florence Cathedral. However, when he presented the work, they said it was too beautiful, and instead they placed it in the courtyard of the Palazzo Vecchio. It's now inside that building, and it's now called the Academia, and it is a museum. Now what's interesting is this is often referred to um, by the Florentine people as the giant, and that refers to the giant block of marble that it was carved out of. This thing was massive. Nobody else wanted to take on the task, but Michelangelo does. 
Now here we do see some of those ideas of balance and symmetry in the work, but it is not quite proportioned correctly. If you look, the hands are very, very large. Now you have to remember this was originally meant to be seen from the ground looking up to the top of the dome. And the hands in the story of David and Goliath, the hands are very, very important because they're literally the tools that he used to use the sling to slay Goliath. Now, the body is in contrapposto, so meaning we see tension in half, the, half of it, and the other half is more relaxed. Now, interesting enough, your text claims that it shows the moment before the battle where David actually looks to the approaching Goliath, but many other scholars disagree with this, and they argue that this is actually both before and after the event simultaneously, that the half that is before, we don't know what the outcome is going to be. And so that's the half that is in tension. Yet the half that is much more relaxed, the idea with this is this is supposed to be after the battle, that David knows he has already won. All right, and then there is some comment about why this is a nude figure. Um, some claim that this is just so it could be not, not be linked with any specific time period, but it could just be that he was following the biblical tale. Um, the text claims that he is a nude figure because Michelangelo, again, focusing on the human form, wanted to show David as a classical nude sculpture. All right, next we're going to move on to some of Michelangelo's work in creating these great tombs. This is the tomb of Giovanni de' Medici, 1509 to 1534, and it is marble. Now, after the death of Julius II, Pope Julius II, we then had Pope Leo X, and then Clementine, Clement VII, and these were all Medici popes. Now, Lorenzo de' Medici died in 1519, and Leo X, and then he was at that time Cardinal, uh, Cardinal de' Medici, um, they commissioned Michelangelo to design a funerary chapel attached to San Lorenzo in Florence. Now, this would contain the tombs of Lorenzo and Giuliano de' Medici, who was the Duke of Nemours, along with the tombs of Lorenzo the Magnificent and his brother Giuliano. So here what we're looking at is we're looking at a detail of the tomb of Giuliano de' Medici. And what we see here is we see these two twisted forms in opposite directions on the sarcophagi. And what these two symbolize is they symbolize the realm of time, meaning the human world. On the left, we see Night, the female form. She is still very muscular, and in fact, Michelangelo would use male models in this, and this shows his desire to show the human form. Male forms at this time tended to be much more muscular than female forms, and so he wanted to show that in the work. Now, what's interesting in Night is that she's not in a peaceful sleep, but she's in a troubled sleep. Her twisted form and the objects that she's shown with, um, the owl, the poppies, the hideous mask, these all symbolize nightmares. On the right, we see the form of Day, which is a male. He is very large and muscular, and he, exact, he is actually straining his limbs against each other. If you look at his leg and his arm, they're almost pushing against each other. And these two forms are supposed to represent the life cycle and the passage of time that ultimately leads to human death. Now above them, we see the figure of Giuliano. He appears in the niche at the apex of the structures. And here he's shown as an ideal attractive man. He's dressed in the armor of a Roman general, and he holds a commander's baton. Opposite of him, on the opposite side of the building, is Lorenzo's tomb, and Lorenzo, Lorenzo is shown as the contemplative man, and he appears deep in thought. However, what's interesting is both Giuliano and Lorenzo are not lifelikenesses, meaning these were not created to look like the men did. Why? Because Michelangelo refused to do it. He wanted to show the forms as he wanted to. And basically he said, who's going to care what they look like in a thousand years? All right, in 1505, Pope Julius II commissioned Michelangelo to finish the Sistine Chapel. There had already been a series of frescoes on the wall, um, and these were started again by Pope Sixtus the, the Sixth, no, the Fourth. Um, the Sistine Chapel, again, was the private chapel of the Pope in the Papal Court, and this is the room where new popes are elected, meaning all the cardinals and the, come, 
and they vote and they select a new pope. This is completely done in secrecy and how the world knows if a pope has been elected or not is when a ballot is being held, an election is, if they do not agree you get a puff of black smoke. If they do agree we get a puff of white smoke out of the smokestack and that lets the world know a new pope has been elected. And this is something that still continues today. Now, interestingly enough, Michelangelo was not overjoyed at getting this commission. I mean, this was a massive, massive project. The ceiling is over 5,800 square feet, and it's 70 feet high in the air. They had to create a massive scaffolding system in which Michelangelo could lay, and he painted on his back. Now, think, if you're painting on your back, what's going to happen? It's all going to be dripping down on him. If you go visit the Sistine Chapel today, you can actually still see the holes in the wall where the scaffolding was. Now on the David um, image here, on the bottom here, there is a link. That actually is a virtual tour of the Sistine Chapel. So you can click on that and you can kind of wander around the entire work. Well, on the ceiling you see here, there are nine narrative panels describing the creation as recorded in Genesis. The center panel shows the story of the creation of Adam, and we see Adam and God. The, again, um, around it there are various Old Testament or Hebrew prophets, and then ancient, ancient pagan sibyls, who were the female prophets, a pair seated in large thrones on both sides of the central row of the scenes from Genesis. Now these were the individuals that foretold the coming of Christ. Overall, there are 300 figures, and there are many whose meanings we do not know. And then he also used illusionary architecture. So what looks like these little nooks and naves are actually painted, right, as are the columns and such. And then here is kind of a diagram to show you uh, what it work, looks like, what each individual panel is. However, I believe this is a mirror image of the one of this work here. Throw it that way. All right. So now let's focus on the creation of Adam. This is the central panel, and this is a very, very bold interpretation of this moment. Here we see God and Adam are both very muscular, again reflecting Michelangelo's style. God actually looks like Zeus, the classical ruler of the heavens. Under God's left arm, you see a woman. Some people claim this is Eve. Others think it is Mary, and if you look at her knee, there is a child. People think this might be Mary with the Christ child at her knee. If this is true, then it links Adam's original sin to the sacrifice of Christ, which in turn made the redemption of all humankind possible. What's interesting is this work is read from right to left and back to the right, meaning we follow God's outstretched right arm to Adam. And that's where we see the spark of life. But then through Adam, we go back from the left up to the right through God's right arm to his left arm to Mary or Eve. And so with this, all of the figures are connected. Again, this panel is full of curves and diagonals. And the work, the entire Sistine Chapel actually um, got very dark and dingy and needed cleaned and restored. And the restoration project lasted from 1977 to 1989. And once it was cleaned, many became very surprised by the bold colors that were shown. In fact, the work I've, you see here, this is the restored version. And so it is very vivid, but it was similar to the works from the Quattro Centro Florentine artists tended to prefer. All right, well, there were some other political uh, significant things going on at the time. We have what's called the Reformation in 1517. And what this is, the Reformation or the Protestant Reformation, shows this discord and unsatisfaction with the church. Martin Luther, probably one of the most famous for sparking this revolution, in 1517 he literally posted his 95 Thesis on the doors of Wittenberg Cathedral. He literally went up and hammered and nailed it in there. And what happens is in the Protestant Reformation is we see this dissatisfaction with the church. Um, and there's a couple different, well, there's many different reasons, but we'll only focus on a few. One of them is a practice that I developed called the buying of indulgences, which meant, you know, part of the church is that your goal 
is to reach the afterlife. And how do you do it is that you are saved. So you have to admit your sins, pay penance, and then you can, when you die, you can go to heaven. Well, what happens is this practice developed where people would go and confess their sins, but instead of having to do penance, you literally could just buy an indulgence, meaning buy your forgiveness. So you can see this led to some corruption within the church. Also, something that was greatly uh, contested in the Protestant Reformation was the actual role of the Pope. The Popes were becoming very, very strong leaders and strong men. And this idea developed is that they weren't just the leader of the church, but that they became the voice of God. So that when they spoke, it was as if God spoke. Well, the, those in the Reformation said that's not true, that the Pope is a man. Men are fallible. God is infallible. So the Pope cannot be the voice of God and that he is just a man who is the head of the church. And so what we're going to see, we're going to see this great split in the church. This is when Protestantism develops. And what happens in Protestantism is you again see this call for a return to the original text, to the original scripture. The role of the Pope is greatly diminished in that he is still seen as the head of the church, but it is the texts that are the actual authority, and, God, and the Pope is not the voice of God. And so we see within this this great split. Well, after this, we have what's called the Counter-Reformation, and this is the church's response to the Protestant Reformation. This was with the Council of Trent in 1545 to 1563, and here the church was addressing these concerns raised. And it was an attempt to reorganize the church and show its followers that it could rid itself of corruption. Um, different popes at this time, Pope Clement VII was followed by Pope Paul III, whose reign was 1534 to 1549. And what we're also going to see during this time is the church goes on a major, major artistic campaign. And what they wanted to do is they wanted to have these great artworks that would hopefully draw people back into the church. And we're going to see this does somewhat work. Now this work, Michelangelo's The Last Judgment, 1536 to 41, this is after the Protestant Reformation. So we see this discord and disharmony in the church. Again, this is a fresco, and it's actually 48 feet tall. Now this was commissioned by Pope Clement VII, who was dying at the time. And what we see here, this is on one of the walls in the Sistine Chapel. And it shows a much darker outlook on life in the afterlife. It is not proportioned. Many of the figures are distorted and twisted. Here we see the Last Judgment. When we talk about the Last Judgment, it's Christ sitting in judgment of the human souls, um, weighing them at their death, either to go to heaven or to go to purgatory or hell. And here we see Christ in the center, and he is the stern judge of the world. And again, he's this large, muscular figure. Mary is already in heaven on his right. And here we see no real sense of realism. The figures at the top are much bigger. And here we see these souls that are waiting to be judged by Jesus and those that are sent to hell. And if you look closer, those that are being sent to hell and purgatory are suffering these great punishments. Also, we see St. Bartholomew, who was martyred by being skinned alive. Here we see him with his flayed skin. And what's interesting is Michelangelo actually put his own self-portrait as the flayed skin of St. Bartholomew. So this is much darker than works we have seen earlier. And we see this again in the unfinished Pietà. Now, this was started 50 years after his first Pietà, and Michelangelo is actually designing this for his own tomb. And what he tried to take on was very, very ambitious. In fact, he tried to carve four figures from one massive block of marble, and he was unsuccessful. If you look, Jesus' left leg is missing. It actually broke off. Um, he abandoned the project in 1555, and he actually tried to smash it. He wanted to destroy it, but his assistants intervened. And it is now in the museum in the Duomo in Florence. Here, this is very different from the earlier Pietà. This shows the body of Christ supported by Mary on the right, who is almost hidden. 
Mary Magdalene on the left, whose figure is shown very, very small, and then Nicodemus is in the back supporting the fallen Christ. In the face of Nicodemus is actually supposed to be a self-portrait of Michelangelo. Again, it is much darker than the earlier work, and it's not as tender as the earlier Pieta. And many scholars believe this possibly might be a reflection on Michelangelo's own impending death. Remember, this was made 1555 uh, when he abandoned it, and he later died in 1564. All right, well, now we're going to briefly switch our focus onto architecture. And I did tell you you could skim this part of the chapter, so we're just going to hit on a few things. Here, what we're going to see in Rome, one of the major products that were taken, projects that was taken on at this time was the rebuilding of St. Peter's Basilica, which had been created in the 4th century. Uh, Bramante, 1444 to 1514, was the first architect hired, and he actually is given credit for developing the High Renaissance plan of the Central Church plan. And you can see this, this is St. Peter's here as it stands today, but you can see this Central Church plan and then in the Tempeto, which is shown here. This was begun in 1502, and this means Little Tempo, Temple. This is based on ancient Roman models, and it was commissioned by King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella of Spain, and it's on the spot where they believed St. Peter was crucified. <coughs> Excuse me. Here we see um, several ration, uh, severe rationality used, and it shows this balance in this harmony. It is inspired by Greek and Roman buildings, but the combination of the parts was completely new and original. Bramante is given credit to being the first to bring back to light the good and beautiful architecture that from antiquity to that time had been hidden. So he's given credit for reviving this Greek and Roman influence. After Bramante's death, um, the commission for St. Peter's was passed from architect to architect, and then finally was actually given to Michelangelo in 1546. Now, Michelangelo struggled to preserve and carry through Bramante's original plan, which he actually praised. Now, he did change some of the design because, not surprising enough to Michelangelo, he claimed the building should also follow the form of the human body. But Michelangelo also died before this could be completed. What ends up happening is Giacomo della Porta actually finally executed the dome, and he restored the earlier high design for the dome after Michelangelo's death. So this actually wasn't even completed in Michelangelo's plan. All right, well, moving to Venice. Uh, Venice, again, is a port city, and it was considered the gateway to the Orient. And Venice at this time period actually maintained its independence during a time where there was political strife in a lot of other areas. Florence, or Venice developed a flourishing, independent, and influential school of artists and architects. And what happens in Venice is that we're going to see, instead of these great palaces, we're going to see these villas in the country develop. And what these villas were, they were elegant residential centerpieces for income-producing farms. And so they're supposed to be smaller in nature. However, we're going to see many of these were still quite grand. And we see that here in the work of Andrea Palladio, 1508 to 1580. He became the chief architect for the Venetian Republic from about 1570 until his death. And we see here his Villa Rotunda. This is near Vincia. This was actually located on top of a hilltop. And what's interesting, you can see two of the facades here, but all four facades are exactly the same. And the idea with this is that it was to provide four beautiful views. So no matter where you were on one of the facades, you would see this beautiful landscape in front of you. So the result of this is a building with functional parts that systematically relate to one another in terms of the calculated mathematical relationship. So again, we see this return to the math. The Villa Rotunda embodies all the qualities of self-sufficiency and for formal completeness that most Renaissance architects sought. All right, well now we're going to stay in Venice, but we're going to shift to painting. Probably the most famous of the Venetian painters was Giovanni Bellini, who we discussed somewhat in Chapter 21. 
Here we see his work, The Feast of the Gods, 1514, and Oil on Canvas. Now what we're going to see in the Venetian works is they tend to favor what's called these Arcadian landscapes. And Arcadian means it's an, it's an idyllic place of rustic peace and, sim and simplicity, meaning this is somewhere you would want to go. It was idealized and it's simple. And we see that here in this work. Now this is based on mythology, but it's much different than works of gods and goddesses we've seen before. Here, the gods appear as peasants enjoying a picnic in a shady glade. We see mellow light, colorful fabrics, smooth flesh, polished metal, and beautiful texture. The atmosphere of this is again idyllic. It's a lush countryside that provides a setting for never-ending pleasure of the immortal gods. And what we're going to see here is this idea that the Venetian artists focus more on color and the process of paint application. In Venetian arts, we're going to see more of this focus on poetry and senses and of the delights. The works are going to delight in nature's beauty and the pleasures of humanity. And we continue to see this in the works of, Gior of Giorgione. Um, Giorgione, quote, says, Giorgione made use of live and natural objects and copied them as best he knew how with colors tenting them with the crude and soft colors that nature displays without making preliminary drawings since he was firmly convinced that painting alone with its colors and without any preliminary study of designs on paper was the truest and best method of working. Now this is going to be very opposite of the Florentine artists who were very mathematical and studious in this. Here, the focus is on the meaning and on the painting itself. In fact, this is what's called poesa, which means painting is meant to operate in a manner similar to poetry. It's supposed to be both lyrical and sensual. And in many Venetian artworks, identifying specific subjects is actually impossible. And we see this in the work here. This is Giorgione's The Tempest, 1509-1510. It is an oil on canvas. Here we see a wealth of color within nature, in the background, something different we usually don't see in these types of paintings. We see a storm is brewing. In fact, there's lightning in the distance. And here, Giorgione did not intend for this to have a specific narrative. We see a woman on the right, a naked woman nursing a child, and then a man on the left kind of more finely garbed. Some people say he's some sort of soldier. But the work does not have any narrative to it, nor did Giorgione intend for it to have a narrative. All right, next we're going to move on to Titian, 1488 or 90 to 1576. He again was from Venice, and he becomes one of the most famous Venetian painters. But again, in his works, we're going to see this careful use and application of color. Now, what's interesting in Venice is we actually see very little fresco work, Venice is a city on the water, and so it was actually very humid, so it was a not a good climate for fresco painting. Actually, they would not last in this environment. What we see works here, this is the Assumption of the Virgin, 1516 to 1518, and it is a panel. This is a very, very large work. It's 22 feet 6 inches by 11 feet 10 inches, and it's in the Santa Maria Glossoria in Venice, Italy. And now what we see here, this is the, the ascension of the Virgin, Assumption of the Virgin is the moment where Mary has died and she is going up to heaven. So we see on the bottom the humans, um, many uh, scholars claim these are apostles, and then Mary's in the middle on a cloud being taken up to heaven, and you can see this is God waiting for her. Well, what makes this so interesting is the colors that are used. You can see how Titian uses the colors in the sky. It almost tends to glow. And how he accomplished this was he applied layers in the colors in glazes. This means there's very little of the pigment or the color in a lot of the linseed oil. And he would apply layer over layer over layer. And in fact, they have x-rayed this work and they believe it has up to 30 to 40 different layers on it. All right, and then a final work that we're going to look at is also by Titian. This is the Venus of Urbino, 1536 to 1538, and it is an oil on canvas. 
This was possibly painted for the Duke of Urbino of the time, and some scholars claim he had it commissioned for his young wife. And the idea of it was that it was supposed to remind her of her duty as a wife. And you can see the Venus as she's laying here. The title of it connects it back to classical antiquity. The small dog shown on the bed, usually when dogs are shown in paintings, especially with women, they're supposed to mean loyalty and fidelity. But again here, we see these compositional elements, and these become the standard for paintings of a reclining female nude. We see the soft lines, the diagonals that are being used. The Venus herself is on a diagonal. And the colors that are being used throughout the work to um, unite it. We see that Venetian red in the pillows she's laying on. And then we also see that repeated in the skirt of the servant woman in the back. Here we see um, these soft lines, but still very realistic and lots of detailing in the work. Now, Titian was also a highly esteemed portrait artist, and in fact, he created more than, different, more than 50 portraits in his lifetime. And what's interesting with his portraiture work was generally it emphasized his own psychological reading of the subject's head and hands, and that he wasn't really worried as much as showing the subject as they physically were, but he was focused more on this psychological importance of the work. All right, that will conclude um, the portion of the chapter that we're going to cover here. Again, in the next lecture, we will pick up with mannerism, and then chapter 23 is going to look at the high renaissance in mannerism in northern, Italy, um, northern Europe, but we will look at these together.